Hey guys and welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Phil Richards. In today's video we're going to be going through passive range of movement testing for the wrist joint. Now the purpose of passive range of movement testing is to see what happens when active contractile structures are taken out of the picture, i.e. active muscles. If you're not sure why we test passive range of movement, check out our video titled Why Test Passive Range of Movement and that will give you a much more detailed explanation on why you need to do it. So in the videos coming up, we're only going to be testing stuff on one side, but of course in clinical practice we want to do it on both sides. It's just so we don't slow your videos down. So when we're thinking about passive testing, we need to think about three things. Pain, range and end feel. They're our key three things. Let's get straight to it. So let's go through our passive range of movement testing of the wrist into flexion. So we're going to do it with the wrist in this position. Uh, you may see from other videos of clearing the wrist, we've done it from this position or other clinicians may do it from here. It's absolutely fine, uh, however you want to do it. The reason that I like to do it from here is it means we can get through the movement testing of different motions with relative ease without trying to remember different positions. It's entirely up to you. So let's go through this. So as the therapist, I'm going to either be sat beside or opposite the patient. The patient's going to be sat comfortably with the arm rested either on a plinth table or on their lap. From here, we're gonna get our hand underneath and we're gonna make sure that we're providing our pressure and motion at the wrist and not the fingers. And we're just going to support the forearm with our other hand. And we're going to provide passive wrist flexion. And don't forget to add your overpressure at the end, remembering the overpressure is coming from here, like the passive movement, not from up here. We're thinking about this part, not compression elsewhere. And we perform it like so. That really is all there is to it. Now we need to consider our pain range and end feel. So if we think about pain, we're trying to remove the active contractile elements. So we're thinking about not active muscles. So what does that leave us with left? We're thinking of an articular problem. So if pain is elicited on here, it could be a problem with the, the radius, the ulna, or the carpal bone, so something articular in the joint. We could also commonly be compressing the carpal tunnel, um, which you can see on the special tests of phalans and reverse phalans. It will kind of imitate that motion, so that could be an issue. The other main consideration is the passive lengthening of the extensors that could occur here. So this is going to probably feel quite uh, elastic and tight when you're doing this passive movement. So let's talk about the type that brings us perfectly onto range. So we're expecting around 75 degrees, but it can go up to a comfortable 90 in our younger, uh, younger or more supple uh, populations, um, especially our hypermobile types. So this is perfectly normal, but also even to around the sort of 75 mark would be considered normal. If you're getting less than this into here, I'm sure you can see that this doesn't look right anyway. This would be kind of an abnormal range. So let's think about our end feel. The end feel is going to feel quite elastic, generally. If you have uh, someone that's had a wrist fracture, etc., this can, quite, uh, can change the articulations here. So you might find it actually feels quite hard. They're not getting this... Uh, this stretchy elastic feeling on the back here um, and that can just be simply from the, the way the articulation has changed from after the fracture with some bony deformity or subluxations in here so that can be considered quite normal. It'll also give you an indication on how you're going to approach any mobilization so for instance if the more I push into here I can just feel a hard end feel and no stretch here we might want to do some mobilization work to try and free this up rather than forcing the patient to just try and stretch here which is just compressing the bones in there. So let's go through passive range of movement testing for the wrist into extension. So as a therapist we're going to preferably be in front of the patient or we can be at the side. I'm going to be at the side today so you can actually see what's going on. Our patient is going to be seated comfortably with the elbow at 90 degrees flexion and the arm is going to be rested on a plinth table or their lap. So all we do from here is we're going to swoop in like a handshake and the other hand is going to support at the distal wrist and preferably not pressing or excessively or compressing the painful area so we're going to go away from that and then we're just going to bring the wrist into passive extension and provide our overpressure. 
Uh, just as a side note, when you're when you're going into overpressure, what you want to imagine you're doing is you're you're slowly tightening like a tap. Is that motion you want to feel? So you're kind of winding and appreciating it. You're not kind of rushing in and going, bang, got it. It won't really tell you much about what's going on. And also, you want to kind of see if it's bringing on pain or apprehension. It's not something you want to be uh, rushing with. So that's that is all there is to it. It's just coming in here, just making sure that you're not pressing at the fingers get close to the carpals so we're actually articulating and providing the pressure here. And so because we're talking about passive range of movement, we need to talk about our pain range and end fill. So P for pain, when are we gonna get that with our, our passive wrist extension? So because we're trying to take out the active contractile element, i.e. the active muscles, we're thinking about all the other stuff. So what's all the other stuff? Well, primarily we're thinking about the, the wrist joints, so the articulation between the radius and the ulnar, or the radius and the carpals, or the ulnar and the carpals. So your common pathologies with that would be wrist instability or a fracture. Um, or you could have tightness and compression here from tight muscles and things, which brings us uh, straight on to, when we do this movement, passive lengthening of this flexor group. That could also be another common source of our patient's pain, especially people that work in excessive wrist flexion positions, this has the opportunity to get very, very tight and irritable. So when you're bringing them around passively, this is getting uh, suddenly a super lengthening and that could be irritating it. So that's a massive consideration for common pathology. Let's move on to R for range. So we're thinking around the 70 degree mark. With pole, we can get, if you can see there, pretty much into this kind of uh, 85, 90 degree mark. So if we get to 70, we'd be sort of here-ish. Anything less than this, I'm sure you can see on camera, that doesn't look right. So this would be abnormal. So we're expecting around here through to here, this range to be our normal range. If it's not, then we need to consider why. Is it, as we said before, the tightening of this? Is it an articular problem in here? And lastly, we consider the end feel. So for passive wrist extension, we're looking for a hard end feel. And this makes sense when you think of how, when we need to load weight, so if you're doing a push up or carrying something heavy, it's going to be a hard end feel because you want the bones actually stacked together to be able to take the forces through and up the, uh, the forearm. If it was very elastic, that's going to be prone to injury. So it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. Um, and that's what you're looking for with your passive end feel. Uh, if you have someone that has uh, fractures, that kind of pathology, an articular problem, you may notice that the, uh, the end feel feels just substantially harder, but it's still, regardless, going to be a hard end feel. So let's go through passive range of movement testing of the wrist into radial and ulnar deviation. We might, this is quite a small video, so we can just do the two together. So as a therapist, ideally, we're going to be sat opposite them. Uh, you're not going to be able to see what's going on if I do that, so I'm to the side today. Our patient is going to be sat with their forearm resting on a table or plinth or on their lap, preferably with the elbow at approximately 90 degrees flexion. So we're trying to get the shoulder out of the way. So all we do from here is we're gonna scoop in it's this kind of handshake position and we're going to do it from here. So if we're thinking about the thumb coming in towards the midline, that will be our radial deviation. And if we're thinking about the pinky coming out from the midline, that would be our ulnar deviation. And essentially, the, the main thing you need to do about this is just make sure that you're trying to compress and uh, articulate the joint here, so i.e. not getting the fingers and the MCPs involved and losing the, the focus of what you're trying to do. So just make sure you get snug in with your grip. You can support uh, under, however, it doesn't really matter too much as long as it's supporting so the movement uh, isn't coming from the elbow. Uh, just don't be too pinchy with your fingers. A nice soft lumbrical grip would be ideal. So let's go through that one more time. So for radial deviation, we're coming in this way. So let's go through our pain range and end feel for radial deviation first. So pain, we know that there's not articular uh, sorry, the, the, the active contractile element is not involved with the muscles. So this is getting the muscles out the way. So the main one I want you to think about is the compression around the radius and the carpal. So we're thinking of an articular problem here. This is gonna be the most typical one you get for P, for pain. So instances of that will be wrist instability or wrist fractures. 
we're expecting the range to be for R around 20 degrees. It's not a big movement. In fact, on pole, it's even less. So we're looking about 5, 10 max. But maybe just um, show you with my wrist, should be getting a bit more than that. But um, that's okay, that's not an issue. The end feel is going to be hard, okay? So it's the, because it's the articulation of the radius and the carpal that is just getting compressed together, it makes sense that it's be, it would be a hard end feel. In some people, if they have chronic tightness in here, you may feel it's um, slightly more elastic, but you might feel it from coming from the opposite side rather than this side. So that's it for radial deviation. Let's go swoop straight into the ulnar deviation. So again, we're talking about our pain range end feel. So P for pain, just as we said for radial deviation, there is no or limited active muscle involvement. So we're negating the muscles. We're thinking about primarily the articulation between the ulna and the carpals. So the pain is likely to be localized to here and is again likely to be associated with the, uh, the wrist instability, either the carpals, radius or ulna, or a fracture. The range is going to be more than uh, radial deviation. For instance, in function, this comes in a lot. So if you're handshaking or using a key, this is very useful to be able to have more ulnar deviation. And so if you're thinking which one's the, the stiffest one, you can just check on your hand or think about how you have function carrying and moving stuff. So the range for this one is about 35 degrees, which Paul has nicely on this one. Um, and there's nothing more to it there. And with regards to the end feel, this one is also going to be hard. It's going to be the articulation between here and here. The bones are being compressed. You're not really gonna get that much more out of it. Having said that, it is slightly softer end feel than on the radial aspect, but it will still be relatively hard. As we said with the previous one, although it's hard here, you may feel it feels more elastic if they have chronic tightness across here as you're stretching these muscles um, or the tissue here but ultimately hard end feel here. Both of these are probably going to be harder and more restricted with fractures. So now let's look at passive range of movement of the wrist into pronation and supination. So as a therapist, we're going to be sat opposite our patient. I'm gonna to be to the side so you can actually see what's going on. Our patient is going to be seated with their forearm rested on a table, plinth, or their lap, and the elbow is preferably going to be in a kind of 90 degrees flexion position to try and exclude shoulder contributions. So how do we do it? So there's a couple of ways we can do it. Um, one is you want to pop your hand over the wrist joint and provide your pressures from here and from here. There are variations you'll see in texts where they come in from the wrist. Um, you can do that, but what you've just got to bear in mind is that you don't start taking the wrist into elements of flexion and extension as you turn, um, if you're trying to keep it as a pure, pure assessment, pure movement. So I like to do the, the hand over the wrist because I feel like I get more control with it. So let's talk about the, the pronation one first. So palm of the hand on the wrist crease, Support the elbow, provide it over, not too crunchy with the fingers, soft hands, and then you can get your end feel from there. Supination, bring it round into a degree of supination to start with. Again, palm over the wrist crease, so we're securing the, the radiocarpal aspect because that's the bit we want to test. Bring it into supination, make sure you get your end feel. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Before we move on from here, if they've had a nasty wrist fracture, there's some high irritability at the wrist. You may want to just leave this one out of your assessment and come back to it another time. You have to ask yourself if you're gonna gain any more valuable information or whether it's worth trying to you know, get it to pronate and supinate from higher up so you don't irritate the area, but then you're like, well, does it, am I articulating more proximal or distal, it's just not really worth your time. You're already gonna have quite a comprehensive assessment anyway with everything else, so you should be able to make your clinical impression from there. So don't get too worried if you omit this one initially or as needed. So let's talk about our pain range in Enfield. So pain, and for let's go for the passive uh, pronation. We know that the active muscles 
aren't being involved, we're thinking primarily of an articular issue here. So we're thinking of where the radius and owner articulate or the radius and the carpal or the owner and the carpals are articulating. So we're thinking of wrist fractures and wrist instability primarily as the source of pain in this test. Our range for pronation is going to be around 70 degrees. Because the radius bone is traveling over the ulna, it's hard for it to get down onto the table plinth and whatever, so it's going to be a bit short of that 80-90 range. The end feel is generally going to be hard, and that's because the, the radius bone is going to struggle to travel um, any further because the bones will be locked against each other, so you're looking for a harder end feel. You're going to expect a more restricted range with uh, radial fractures, and it will be a much harder end feel than, than normal. So let's spin round to our supination. So from here into here, and then think about our pain range and end feel for there. So just as we did on the other side, the pain is gonna be for similar reasons. So we're thinking about an articular problem here with the radius bone, ulna bone, or carpal bones. And again, we're thinking of wrist fractures or wrist instability. The range for this one, because these two bones are gonna be sitting in parallel, is going to be higher, so we're getting to around 85 degrees-ish, so they both should kind of sit flat and flush. The end feel for this one is going to be hard slash elastic. It will feel, you don't want to put too much pressure on this one when you're coming into here. It's, uh, it's quite a nasty feeling you're going to get, um, or the personally when you feel it done. Um, so don't be surprised if it's a mixture of hard and elastic, but that's very common. Again, if you've got a fracture or an instability, you may be getting extra compression in here, uh, and it may feel very particularly hard, which would be an abnormal feeling if it's excessive. And that's really all there is to it for that one. So let's summarize this video of passive range of movement testing of the wrist joint. Go through the passive movements of wrist flexion, extension, radial deviation, ulnar deviation, supination, and pronation. Consider the patient position, therapist position, and handling as we have gone through in the video. Make a note of pain, range, and end feel for each of these movements. And that completes our video on passive range of movement testing at the wrist joint. So now you've done your passive testing, you can compare this to your active range of movement testing. And by comparing the two, you'll be able to see if it's an active contractile element that's causing your patient's condition, i.e. an active muscle group. This, along with your other tests, can clarify your patient diagnosis and your clinical impression. If you're not sure why you test active range of movement or passive range of movement, please check out our other videos titled Why Test Active Range of Movement and Why Test Passive Range of Movement. Guys, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again soon right here on Clinical Physio.